Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Dr. George Holmes. George is the CEO and founder of Hire Henry, a St. Louis-based robotic lawnmower company. George, welcome to the pod. Yeah, thanks, Spencer. Glad for you to join us out here. Thanks for coming on. Good to have you on. I, I'm really interested to learn a bunch of things from you for reasons I kind of discussed before, but you're the only, the first St. Louis-based robotics company like I'm getting to know someone from, so I'm really excited to hear more about your scene kind of how you got into it. Um, yeah, let's just go right in and then we'll, we'll kind of branch out. Yeah, sure. So for a little bit of context for the folks li listening in, Spencer and I first met in Pittsburgh at a robotics conference. And for all the folks listening in, they'll be very familiar with the fact that Pittsburgh is booming as a, as a robotics hub and it's emerging in a lot of different ways. St. Louis is a little bit more based on uh, small businesses and software type companies, a lot of really good t talent coming from universities out of the area. Part of the reason why Higher Henry is, is located out of St. Louis is both my co-founder and I went to school at Missouri University of Science and Technology. Oh, cool. I've heard good things about that school. Yeah, yeah, it's a really good university, uh, particularly around manufacturing and a lot of theoretical controls from the graduate school is pretty strong, which is actually part of what I did my PhD in. Um, so we're headquartered in St. Louis because after graduation, we got a really good grant to be able to relocate there. We've had a great experience so far with the startup scene. That's awesome. Yeah, I, um, there's an engineer I used to work with who, uh, who went to that same school, and he was always saying really good things about it. So that's, that's super cool. <laughs> it's like kind of remembering a bunch of things now. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's neat. I don't know many startups that are grant funded either. Like I feel like a lot of people take just venture capital money and kind of run with it. So it's cool to see like a different path being taken. I, I think I mentioned, and maybe I will talk about this. I was thinking about doing a um, service-based landscaping startup maybe uh, in the not too distant future. So I'm really interested to kind of hear what your journey has been like and I, you know, probably be good for me personally and then maybe also for the listeners to, to hear that. Yeah. I mean, I want to hear more about, about what you're thinking too, Spencer. I think this would be a good time for us to just bounce ideas off. Yeah, sure. Why not? We may be able to listen in. Um, so our path has been very different from most companies to your point. Uh, 2018, we got a grant from the National Science Foundation i -Corps program. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Spencer's doing a, a fist bump for those listening on audio only. Uh, i -Corps is program. awesome. <laughs> yeah, we did over 300 interviews with industry stakeholders. We traveled to over seven states, went to wow. the largest landscaping conferences in the industry, and really started to hone in on how big the challenge is around labor for commercial lawn care. Both my co-founder and I being millennials, we really focused on what does the future of work look like in this space. And at Higher Henry, a big part of our focus is creating that future of work. We just don't envision a reality where folks are going to drive around in Teslas but we're going to have other folks that are driving around on gasoline powered riding lawnmowers <laughs> in, the hot sun, in the hot sun for seven hours a day. I just, we just don't envision a future like that. So yeah, we're that seems probable. Work in this space. Yep. Cool. That makes sense to me. Um, so I guess I'll tell you a little bit about the idea that I'm thinking about monetizing. There's a video on YouTube that shows it as an SKA, uh, which is my consulting company show project. Um, so it's called Ructro and it's a, um, robotic wheelbarrow, uh, targeted at the landscaping industry. So the idea is to move medium around landscaping sites. So like gravel, dirt, sand, um, wood chips, things of that nature. And, and just allow you to kind of keep a tighter crew mm -hmm. and, you know, maximize the uh, efficacy of your people on the site. So that's, that's the idea. I don't know if we're going to do it yet or not, but, um, one of my friends has me like 40% convinced to maybe finance that more traditionally and yeah. think about it that way. So I don't know. that sounds cool. So you said robotic wheelbarrow, just so we're visioning this properly. Is it actually something that somebody's holding and pushing that's like self propelled or is it fully like so, a mobile robot type? That's a good question. I'm glad you asked. So um, those do exist. I believe, um, I think Toro makes something in that market with the self propelled units. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe John Deere. I don't know if they have an offering there or not. I feel like there might be a Gator offering there too, although I could be wrong on that. Mm -hmm. But um, those exist. Um, no, I was thinking fully autonomous uh, with some waypoint navigation on board. 
uh, and then maybe some functionality to um, help with either a loading or unloading or some form of both. Um, probably just the unload to start and then maybe later on the loading um, just to kind of, you know, attack it like easiest piece first. Yep. That's awesome, man. That's pretty cool. First, first thought that comes to my mind is some of the agriculture robotics companies, right, that are using those type of wheelbarrow type applications except in farms. And to your point, I'm sure there could be a lot of applications in the landscape and space as well. Yeah, I think Turo has got a pretty similar product that they're, I think they've got in market right now where they're doing that for the farming market. I might be butchering this. I hope not. I think it's T-U-R-O is the name of the company. Oh, you're not thinking of Burrow, are you? Burrow. I'm an idiot. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, I got you that. Burrow's doing something similar. Future Acres is doing something similar. Yeah. yeah. So many cool robotics companies doing cool stuff. Yeah, for sure. No, it's awesome. And it's hard to keep track of all of them. I mean, I, I Burrow I became aware of not too long ago. So, I, I, again, I appreciate you setting the record straight. I feel like I'm a little rusty on, on the whole landscape. So I'm glad I got someone knowledgeable here with me. We got to get them here on the podcast. Yeah, that sure. interview. If you know anyone, man, I'd really appreciate an intro. I would, I would love to get to know them. Yep. I haven't met them yet. That's all Fair enough. Yeah, one of these days, right, one of us will open the door for the other one. <laughs> cool. Um, so I guess when you were starting Hire Henry, like what gave you that idea? What made you decide you wanted to go into that market? Uh, and like what was that journey like? So you talked about the NSF grant um, with the i program, but – before you did that, you must have like started to think about it as an idea and, and kind of envision it. So how did that journey kind of go for you? If we go back to high school, Spencer, I grew up mowing grass with my grandfather. He's 86 years old. He lives in St. Louis. He'll do 20 or 25 yards around St. Louis this oh, wow. summer. Absolutely. Yeah, he's in really good shape. <laughs> he used sure. to pick me up from home and... Um, I would load up on Benadryl because I know we're going to be mowing grass all day long. I got bad allergies. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, which doesn't make it fun at all. We'd stop by McDonald's, grab him a, a senior coffee, and then we would mow grass all day long. And uh, at the time, I would think to myself, there got to be some type of way to build a robot to do this type of thing. I think most <laughs> teenagers, <laughs> most teenagers had that thought at some point throughout their life. Yeah, I'm sure. I have no idea. Right. I had no idea how to build robots. I worked on cars at the time, so it was oh, good with my awesome. hands. Didn't know how to build a robot, and then eventually got into mechanical engineering. Again, my co-founder and I started to study the commercial landscaping industry. Saw that this was a much bigger problem than just me not enjoying mowing grass. But this was <laughs> a big labor problem in the future. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. That's that's really cool and. The fact that you've managed to condense your story down into like, you know, that amount of time is incredible. Uh, clearly, it's not the first time you've told that. <laughs> That's part of my job. I it you 300 companies. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, really good at the story. That's cool. So, um, can I ask, like, this is totally tangential, but these tend to go kind of like off the rails a little bit. Yep. What kind of cars did you work on in high school? Oh, I, my God. I've been doing that lately, and I mean, in grad school is when I got into working on cars. So. Yeah, man. I'm glad you asked. So, went to two high schools. One was specifically focused on auto mechanics. Cool. And one was specifically focused on academics and fell in love with working on Hondas. My first car was a Honda Accord. Mine too. Same. Your first car was a Honda Accord? Yeah, it was a 2000 Honda Accord. Nice. That's awesome. Mine was a 94. Nice. That's awesome. <laughs> That's yeah, really man. Cool. So, fell in love with Hondas. I've had two Honda CRVs and a Honda motorcycle. Nice. And when I, when I went to school for engineering, Spencer, first of all, I wasn't planning on going to engineering school. I was planning on going to auto mechanic school. And my grandma was like, you should go to mechanical engineering because you can design cars instead of working on them. So, I went into mechanical engineering with the goal of working for Honda. Got my dream job working for them uh, as an intern after my sophomore year in college. Learned a lot. Was able to see the cars come together down the assembly line and really fell in love with this idea of people That's using awesome. robots to get a job done. That was part of what's driven our vision here at Higher Henry. That's really, really cool. I, um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty jealous. I, I, I want to think of how I frame this so I don't get myself in trouble. Um, I won't say when, but at a certain point, I um, 
had the fortune of being in some automotive manufacturing facilities, and I won't say which ones or the context because that will get me in trouble. Uh -huh. But seeing those lines, like you know, like cent a million dollar lines um, for for making engines and transmissions. Um, I mean, it, it's just I've never seen anything else at that scale from a production perspective, and I feel like it's it's super duper eye opening, and it it really makes you think. I agree. It, it's amazing. I mean, to see something come in at the beginning of a factory that's just frames and sheet metal and then see this moving thing coming out the end, I think it's super powerful. And I think in a lot of ways, that's what we're going to see happen with robots over the next couple so. of years. Oh, absolutely. We're starting to see some of it, but I think one of, the, one of the key things, Spencer, is so many folks that start robotics companies have never had the experience of being in a manufacturing facility and being mechanical engineers and designing these things for mass scale and mass manufacture. And as we start to combine that mechanical background with really good software, which so many companies are doing nowadays, that's when we really start to see really cool applications and a lot of really cool products. I agree. Here. I've not seen a, well, I guess there probably are counters to that. Roomba is, is a, an example of a mass produced robot that like everyone's had one of at some point or another. Yep. So, all right. So there's a few. Oh, of course, <laughs> of course, of course. Yeah. Well, have you ever read a book called Freedom's Forge? I, a buddy of mine got me into this recently. It's um, so it's I, I'm a big history um, buff, and so one of my most fascinated by points in history is World War II. And uh -huh. so I, I've as a kid, I watched every History Channel thing. My my mom would be like, "Why are you watching that stuff? It's so bleak." And I just thought it was really interesting. So I, I you know just every single special that came out about. The kind of messed up stuff like Hitler. I was like, oh, this is interesting. I want to, I want to watch all of it and learn and, you know, all the stuff. Or they'd have weird ones. Like one was on like a propaganda campaign campaign for like, um, it was like sex and propaganda and it was on the History Channel. And basically it, it interviewed a censor or not a censor, a propaganda artist. And they gave her a picture of Hitler wearing lederhosen and he kind of had his arms crossed. And then they were like, you, Miriam will impose a penis under this photo so to make him look like he's masturbating. And then the caption was, what we have, we hold, which was like a German military cliche at the time, which is like, if we take land, we're not going to retreat. But in this case, obviously, it meant something different. So, you know, as a 15-year-old, that's the most hilarious thing in the world. So I, I would watch all this stuff and giggle, and I just thought it was really fascinating. Anyway, recently a friend of mine told me about Freedom's Forge, and it follows um, American industrialists... Um, as they kind of get taken from the um, airplane and automotive industries and brought into the service of the country during World War II. And oh. so one guy in particular, I want to say um, the guy that started Kaiser Permanente is one of the main figures in the books, you know, the West Coast, it's like all their hospitals. So I can't remember, I think it was Dams that was his big thing where he made all of his money and, and impact. But there was another guy, and I'm blanking on the name, I really wish I could remember right now, but he's kind of like the, the protagonist of the book. And I think he was the president of General Motors, although he might have been some other, I think it was the president. And Correct. he got called into service and commissioned as a general. And um, he would go and visit different aircraft production facilities and he would audit them down to like the lowest level. Like, you know, what's that, you know, why is there a bare tire on that car in the parking lot? Like these people got to be able to get to work. You know, we need to, you know, take some of the rubber allotment and give it to, you know, that employee. So, uh, you know, they, they aren't late and they don't slow down the production of airplanes because that's going to screw us over. And yep. so it was, you know, this guy was just, he would go in like a consultant, like flying around on a private plane and just going to different factories and kind of shore them up in that way. So I thought that was really interesting as somebody that's interested in production. And then it talks about like when they put the um, atomic bomb into production, when they put the B-29 uh, bomber into production... It was the B-29 was actually the most complex uh, like piece of hardware ever built at the time. And hmm. um, it had like, I think over 150,000 different components in it. And they had electrical problems kind of from the start. So the book goes into like how they addressed those problems, how they structured the production line, how they took like the assembly line concept from automotive and brought it into airplanes, which like a lot of the airplane manufacturers at the time said would never work. And then they also took similar concepts and brought them into the shipping industry. So for like the Liberty Ship program, at one point I think they were releasing a new ship every week because the Germans were sinking them really quickly. And so it's just interesting to see how 
like a big part of shipbuilding, I think before then was that everything was custom made to a blueprint and like the ship had like a, I mean, I think they still named them and like did like, you know, a bottle of champagne on the hull and all that stuff. Mm. But it was, they were releasing them super duper quick, you know, and, and they all were done off a blueprint. And then they, they took out parts that didn't really need to be in there, you know, and they sort of simplified the designs and then they added more welding operations in and less riveting uh, and just different stuff to make them more practical to produce. When they were making weapons for the war, I think it was similar. Like they took out rivets, they added welds and then fit and finish were try they tried to reduce that. So a lot of it was down to like machine tool repeatability. So, mm -hmm. you know, if this piece will always connect to that piece, regardless of the, you know, if it's serial number one or 75,000, then you've got, you know, interoperability or inner replaceability of components, you know, and then serviceability becomes easier. You don't have to deal with fit and finish on every single unit and stuff that's obvious now, but like back then was a game changer. So sorry, I'm rambling, but. No, 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 man. I think it's interesting because, you know, war sucks, man. War it sucks. Does. Yeah, I, I hope we come to a day where we don't have to deal with that anymore as people. But looking at it purely from a historical standpoint, so much technology has progressed for military aims. Um, one one thought that comes, and there's a lot of applications that we don't really think about oftentimes. I mean, a lot of people mention GPS coming from military funding and so many other things. But Absolutely. One, one that comes to mind about World War II specifically is Henry Ford and, and his tractor. Oh, yeah. World War there was a huge famine, not a lot of food to go around, and uh, Henry Ford was able to ship a bunch of tractors over in the year to be able to help provide food for That's awesome. not only the soldiers, but the civilians over there. So, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, no, at the same time period, like radar, I mean, was came into existence. You look at, I mean, atomic energy, you know, hopefully we never drop one of those bombs ever again. That's pretty horrible, but... Just the amount of like the the power output is really cool. Like when you look at it being used as an energy source, um, nuclear submarines where you can you know kind of have people underwater for months on end, you know, and really they only have to come up for food. I mean that's pretty neat. The space program, right? I mean that was almost like a German creation because of the V two missile program, which we took all those scientists and put them to work over at NASA after the war, you know, and that became the uh, you know the Saturn you know moon program. So, yeah, the, the list goes on and on. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Radio communications. I mean, I don't know. I'll shut up now. But yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I, I, I too, like, I'm not actually a fan of war. Like, I'm not, you know, one of these people that, that wants to see people fighting or, you know, like, I don't get super excited about the latest military technology. But, I mean, I study history and you can't ignore the, the technological contribution there. So yeah. that's, that's kind of where I was coming from with that. I guess what I started to think about is, you know, I really am an optimist in a lot of ways about the future. I think it'll become a day where we won't need to work. I think that robots will take a lot of the load off of people and we'll be able to do part of what really makes us special as human beings, which is connecting with other people, spending time with loved ones, using our creativity to make, a, make the world a better place. And when that reality or what I think will eventually become a reality when it's that case in the world, we have to think about what that looks like for people, right? And the same thing I, I, I say about war. One day, you know, all things go well. War is no longer a thing whatsoever. How do we be sure that as a society we're continuing to generate new technologies and new products that are still completely changing the game, right? Even if we don't have that as a, as a driving function. I hope you're right. <laughs> I really do. Were you a Star Trek fan growing up? I feel like that's like very similar to like the, the vision for the future that's on that show. I wasn't. I wasn't a Star Trek fan, unfortunately, although I've heard a lot about it. I only got into it in grad school. I, I didn't want to be typecast as a nerd when I was in high school, so I didn't let myself have it <laughs> until I was getting my master's degree. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. just, just a lowly master's degree over here. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that was, um, I can't remember the creators, and I've been so bad at names lately, but I think that was his vision for the future too, was, you know, like one day we're not going to need war or, or, you know, really like commercial competition to the same extent that we have it now, because we'll just have so much stuff that, you know, like you know, people won't need to do all that stuff, you know, we can just focus on the advancement of society. And I'm, I hate to say it, but, you know, we always get philosophical on these things and I'm a little bit more of a cynic, so I don't know. I, I'm just, I don't want to say pessimistic because I don't think that's accurate, but 
I'm just, I'm a little more cynical. I, I tend to see kind of like the dark side of where it could go, but I hope I'm wrong. And, you know, I, I don't rule out that I could be. And so I, I hope you're right on that. It all comes down to people, man. I and mean, we like to talk a lot about technology, but it always comes down to people. How do we make sure that people feel included in our society, that they have what they need to provide for themselves and for their families, that they have mental health support, you know, that, that I mean, all these things are crucial. And yeah, it's education. important stuff, for sure. Ed education, absolutely. Without those things, then we, we, we might go to a bad place. Yeah, no, I agree. And I'm, I don't know, not to get too political, but I, I sort of agree with you that, like, education should be, you know, universally accessible. And, you know, I, I think that's a good thing for society because the more you educate people, the more you get access to minds you wouldn't otherwise have access to in industry and you're able to advance in you know, the species as it were. And so, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that's good for everyone. <laughs> so I can agree with you I'm on that. You. Yep. Cool. All right. So I guess what's it been like, um, you know, kind of bringing this company up over the last four years? Um, what are some of the, I guess, the struggles, the wins, you know, the, the pivots that you've, you've gone through and, and how's that kind of shaped your perception and your, your, uh, your direction, like your, your process, you know, your mental model, like kind of your methods, you know, going forward. Absolutely. So a little bit of context for the, for the listeners, um, Hire Henry develops industrial robotic lawnmowers for large green spaces. So these are like Super duper portable lawnmowers that can mow a lot of grass really, really fast. I can almost guarantee you, whatever you're envisioning in your mind is probably not what our product looks like at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, when people see it, it's like, oh, I was not expecting that at all. So go to hirehenry.us, go to our website, and take a look at what this thing looks like. It almost like. reminds me a little bit of like a flying wing, if I if I may. A like, flying well, wing? Just because it's wide, right? Like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yep. The That's idea is to like be super duper low profile, but again, big enough that it can mow a lot of grass. So I can definitely see like a flying wing analogy. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, we've deployed these mowers you know, down in Texas. We're in North Carolina right now deploying mowers, headed to Virginia next week That's to cool. deploy. So those are all big wins. And you know what? When we talk about what are some of the big takeaways, I'll go right back to the comment that we made before. It's really all about people. Right. Yeah. When you're trying to address a, a problem that folks have around labor, you got to frame it in such a way that they understand the technology. They already understand their problem, but you got to bridge that gap of how the technology that we're developing at Higher Henry can, of course, address their larger, larger needs and desires. Yeah. And I sense. mean, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I guess like as a roboticist, for me, it's not always easy to, to do that because that's what you're doing is talking about voice of the customer, I think. So like, how do you build stuff that actually addresses a real market need is what I got from what you were saying. And yep. so for me, a lot of times, like when I'm building something, I'll get really excited about the technical details and be like, this is going to have all these extra mechanisms and it's going to be really, really cool. And it's going to do all this stuff. And then you realize that every single one of those subsystems adds cost and maybe not value. And so, you know, it's not always been in my scope of work to consider such things, you know, as, as a consulting engineer, a lot of my work has been just whatever idea you got, like I'll bring the firepower to get it built. And yeah. so that's kind of fun because you get to let your imagination go wild and, and not really think about, I mean, you still don't want to waste your client's money, but if they want something, you know, it's sort of, it's outside your scope of work to think, is that the right thing to build? You're just like, all right, let's figure out how to build it, you know? And so that's kind of a yeah. fun fun way to go about things but then you know when i'm considering like if i want to start a product company i mean that's a totally different you know set of rules as it were because it's like you know i mean should i be building this you know <laughs> and so that's and i think we're we're on the exact other end of the spectrum right we came we started higher henry while we were in university we came out of school oh cool you know having raised all non-dilutive capital super capital efficient had to figure out how to make these products with very low low cost and tight budget and what that's done for us is develop this muscle of how to develop products in a cost effective manner we built several units and deployed them so the amount of traction that we've been able to get, and I'm sure a lot of listeners are roboticists by training and may not have a lot of business background, 
it's so important to be able to, to your point, bridge that gap. And the other piece to, to thinking about people is investors. So for folks that are coming from a robotics background and even a lot of my lab partners and friends that I talk to and colleagues, we all know that what robotics can do and it's this big opportunity of what we can bring to reality. But when you talk to investors and you talk to folks outside of the community, it's very easy to see how so much of what we're doing is so cutting edge. Like a lot of the technologies that we're developing and bringing to market, folks have never seen before, and that's extremely exciting. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I, I did some work in mining um, almost 10 years ago now. Um, this would have been in like 2014. And um, it was interesting to see kind of the resistance of that market, but also the excitement of that market when you'd bring in a new tech. And it didn't take much like, you know, there's not a whole I mean, I guess there is now with like Cad, Caterpillar and the work that I mean, I was with Joy Global, but now that's a division of Komatsu because they you know, got acquired. Um, but um, we we're working on these four story high mining vehicles. And, you know, we were, we were doing stuff that it felt to me like I'm like, this is basically 80s technology, you know, like coming from Carnegie Mellon. I'm like, you know, this, we, we had this stuff in the 80s. Like, what are we doing here? And they're like, no, no, no this is new for this market. Don't worry. And so it was kind of neat to see, like, just how excited some of the customers would get or even the executives at the company that had never seen anything like this when you demo, you know, a new autonomy system. And so it, has that been your reaction too? Yep. And that's the sweet spot. It's like what we really want as businesses is for a lot of the technology, if not all of the technology, certainly, you know, 99% of the technology to be developed very close to maturity. And we can integrate those things, maybe add a little bit of intellectual property to it, such that we have a differentiation or a competitive moat of some sort around the product and then be able to go to market. And folks are like, wow, how did you put this together? And it's like, no, we leverage all of these resources. <laughs> Someone like, else has been this down this path. Yeah, absolutely. So when we talk about like using 360 degree computer vision for obstacle detection around Henry and being able to put this virtual 20 foot radius boundary and anything that comes within that radius, we can automatically <laughs> cut off the blades and we can automatically stop and we can use this computer vision to help us localize ourselves in addition to GPS. It blows folks minds. It's like, hey, we're using a lot of research that uh, that folks have developed in academia, and we're adding a little bit of our proprietary mechanisms to it as well to make it special. But we're leveraging so much of what's been done already. Can I ask <laughs> what what sort of vision sensors you're using on Henry? Um, I, I'm kind of curious because I mean that's something I'm really interested in right now. Yeah, we we've looked at RealSense and used RealSense in the past. Same here. Big, yeah, I, I mean, I think every robot is right. Yeah, for sure. Every, if you look on Vecna's website, I think it's like in their video crawl. Yeah. No, it, it's really cool to think about some of these camera systems that are coming to have onboard compute where you can take some of the power off the processor yeah. and being able to do it on the camera itself. OpenCV came out with the Oak D camera, which is extremely interesting. I didn't know about but that. One, one of, oh, you haven't heard about the Oak D? No, not yet. What is that? Oh, you need to take a look at that. OZ man. camera? What's that? OZ? Oak. D. Oak D. Oh, I have heard of this. Okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah. so My this knowledge. is from OpenCV, the folks that are developing a lot of cool computer vision algorithms and, and libraries for folks to use. And you know what, Spencer? We bet early on, years ago, that this, this is what would happen. More and more modules and tools, both on software and hardware, would come out, and it would enable robotics companies to leverage those technologies to go to market faster and have a better product. And yeah. so far, we've been right. We've seen cameras come out. We've seen computer vision algorithms become more and more available, localization solutions, communication protocols, fleet management softwares. And we're going to see more and more of all have these you, tools. And that's when we're going to see robotics companies start to really flourish. Have you, who have you worked with in terms of fleet management? Because um, we stuck Formant on a few of our robots. And it was, it was pretty awesome what you were able to do with that just right out of the box. Yeah, we, we've had a lot of conversations with Format. They're doing cool work. Big I fan. Actually did. What's that? It's a big fan. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like I said, more and more companies are going to continue to do the, the very important work that Format's doing. They just published an article, an op-ed article that we wrote with them uh, just a couple weeks ago. So folks interested in kind of talking more about how these robotics tools are going to become more and more common in the industry, again, go out and check out that, 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 um, that piece 
the higher Henry Road whip format. Oh, that's but they're awesome. doing very interesting work around fleet management. Yeah, that's that's really cool. A small world. <laughs> yeah, small uh, industry, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, the amount of familiar faces I saw at that Cascadia event that we met at. I mean, you know, it's like, and people that don't even live in Pittsburgh. I'm like, oh, hey, how you been? You know, like, yeah, kind of kind of makes you think. Or like even people I hadn't met, but I knew about their robot or their company just from, you know, being a super nerd. <laughs> just like, wow, that's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, I I talked to uh, I mentioned like Mike Oitzman last week from. Um, the robot report and that guy, I mean, I, 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 I mean, I'm sure you've done it too, where you read the RBR top 50 that year. You're like, who's coming up? Like, tell me, I want to know. And so, yeah. um, I don't know. It was so exciting to have that guy on, you know, just felt like meeting like, a, you know, a childhood hero or something, you know, just like, uh, yeah. Like, then you go to Cascadia and be able to have a conversation with him and pick his brain. It's, it's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Steve Cousins was really interesting to meet, the dude that started uh, Willow Garage back in the day, which I'm sure, yep. like, you must have messed around with this in university, too, like the PR2s and all that Willow Garage stuff. Like, we, we had some of those at CMU, and, I mean, I, I, I sent him a picture after the event of, like, some circuit boards I had from the PR2 that his group worked on, and I just titled it, and the subject line of the email was, like, Blast from the Past. And, <laughs> and he was like, yeah! <laughs> so that was kind of cool. That was awesome. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's fun to, to find relatability with people like that. When I was an intern at SpaceX, I remember, um, you ever go to a store called like Robot Store as a kid or like, it was like mainly hobbyist stuff, but they sold like hobbyist robot platforms and stuff. I think they were big in the um, early 2000s, but um, oh. I, I was kind of a tinkerer growing up, similar to you, but just you know, different things. and. One of the things I looked at, like you, you're thinking about, like, could I roboticize this? I was like, could I automate the lights in my bedroom? You know, could I? Uh -huh. and so, I I got a um, a bunch of relays and I figured out how to interface them to a parallel port, and then um, the electrician my parents had working in the house wouldn't let me install it because I was a I was a 12 year old. Of but course. I, remember, <laughs> I, I came up with this whole thing with like 90s technology to to switch off and on the lights and you know. Now that's like a pretty common product with like Philips Hue and Smart Home and some of the yeah. other things. So I feel like I, I really kind of timed that one wrong. But, um, you know. But that's valuable, that's valuable learnings, right? To be able to get at a young age is so important. That's what future engineers and technologists need is to be able to hack on things and play around with stuff at an early age. You know, I mean, Radio Shack, of course, was a lot of oh, fun. Oh, dude. <laughs> For me growing yeah, it's hard to see them go. But yeah. for me growing up, you know, growing up with a single mom, it was always like, hey, don't burn the house down. Don't kill yourself. <laughs> it was super duper, like, try to keep everything as, as safe as possible and try not to uh, burn anything down. So to be able to, like, go into engineering and see all these tools and things that you can build. Oh, and when you get in your first engineering shop after being that tinkering kid and you see the way oh, the industry man. does it, I mean, it's like, uh, your mind blows up. I mean. Or even the right software. To start writing software at a young age just opens up the mind as to what the possibility are, possibilities are. I didn't really get start start to write code until college. But when you think about kids now, I mean, kids have been doing this for a while, but especially kids now and the emphasis in schools of exposing kids to programming, I just get excited about what we're going to see come from these students 10 years from now or 15 years from now. And for us as companies to be able to work with them and bring them in and help them take their projects to the next level, I think is a beautiful thing. Yeah, I don't disagree. Um, I, I mentored high school kids for a while when I when I first got out of university um, with first robotics teams. And that was kind of rewarding just to show kids the stuff that I used to like to do when I was that age. So I'd be like, yeah, you should check out this Dremel. You can, you know, cut a bolt head right off and you know, just, just fun, you know, like try to be accessible and make it fun for them was, was kind of my thing. And then I started programming graphing calculators. My first programming language was TI basic on the TI okay. plus in sixth grade. Uh -huh. And I remember, um, we made a program that made random seating assignment charts, but it would always seat me next to my best friend. <laughs> so, nice. <laughs> yeah. You know, I was rigged. And so, 
Uh, but the, the teacher knew that and didn't care because, you know, gave her something she wanted. So that was kind of a powerful lesson. And then I made another program that would solve geometry homework. And then it would show you all the steps to, to be able to put your work on the assignment. So it was kind of brainless and you could reduce your cognitive load. And nice. so that was kind of neat. Yeah, I called it Shape It because I had no branding sense at the time. And so, yeah. you know, it was like, um, yeah, it's kind of, you know, just like you said, it's mind expanding. Yeah. We, we talk about like developing two pieces of this puzzle, right? We're talking about robotics companies. One piece is to be able to just hack on things and put things together and make it work. And I think I was able to scratch my itch in that way, like I mentioned before with cars. Yeah, but trying to get into that to grad to... school. So I feel like you were yeah. way ahead of me in that area. Look, it, it's so powerful. It's so saved me so much money over the years. Oh, so same. much I've been able to help family members. Like it's just insane. But what I used to do, add a little business component to that. Nice. Is I would go to like salvage yards and junkyards, and I would get parts that I need to be able to fix on whatever I was working on. So I would work on buddies' cars and whatnot. And uh, it's inevitable. You're getting ready to walk out of the junkyard or the salvage yard, and you see somebody walking around. They don't have any tools. They look lost. They don't know what they're looking for. You walk up, hey, you know, what kind of parts you looking for? What type of car here? Let me take you over. I can show you exactly what you need and how to get it off before you know it. They say, here's 20 bucks. Go ahead and pull the part off. And then you're getting more money because they want you to come to their house and install it and all that good stuff. That's awesome. So for, so for me, it's like, I think this is for a lot of young people. It's not just about how can I play around with hardware or play around with, with software, but so many young people want to figure out how do I get access to these tools and then be able to make some money now. And yeah, I, we yeah, see that sure. more and more with generations going going forward. And cars are interesting, Spencer, because they have every engineering system you could possibly want. All in Amen, one. Amen, George. No, I completely look, agree. Look, look, you got mechanical, okay. you got electrical, yep. you got fluid, you got your heat transfer, yep, you absolutely. got mechanical design, you got mass manufacturing, you got software. Everything that you want is in one system. And let me ask you this. What other system can you find in the world where you can pay $1 or maybe for free, you can get into this museum where you can see 20, 30, 40, 50 years worth of designs across several countries? And that's what you do when you go to a salvage yard. You see German engineering. That's awesome. You see Japanese. You see American. And you get to see how these things have evolved over time. And I think that that helps the engineering brain start to work through new solutions of doing things. Well, absolutely. Well, because I got into it later than you. I mean, I did my suspension last week on the front of my uh, my Toyota that I got now that I'm driving. Nice. And I remember like just seeing how that mechanism works. So I, I, I've always done quick struts in the past, but because of supply chain shortages, I couldn't get the quick struts I wanted from KYB. So I had to buy Moog Springs and KYB struts. And nice. then I bought a bunch of KYB uh, strut components and I assembled all of it. Um, so that was cool because I learned like how a strut gets put together, which it's not that complicated, but it was still educational. Yep. And then, um, you know, I, I looking under the hood and seeing how the engine works. Every time I have to fix something on an engine, my perception of how an engine works is expanded. And I only mm -hmm. really know Japanese because I've always had Japanese cars. Mm -hmm. But I mean, whenever I look inside, like I've had a few friends with like 60s and 70s muscle cars who are really into that, like American. And, yep. you know, that's a totally different design. Like just seeing how the, like the engine's usually at a 90 degree angle for it isn't like a front wheel drive Japanese car. Yep. And, you know, just there's way more space around it. And the design philosophy is different, like thicker gauges of steel. Yep. Um, and it's just, it's a totally different beast. And then, I mean, from that era, there's like no electronic controls. Whereas, you know, yep. like 90s onward, it's all electronics. And so, yep. I mean, it's yep. just, you know, it's, it's interesting to see kind of, like you said, the evolution and the history and, um, you know, just the, I mean, that field is so, it takes so many people to make something like that, like a system that's produced at that quantity. And I mean, you're built, you're standing on the shoulders of giants. Like it's, it's all been done. And like you said, I mean, we're probably going electric like sooner than not. And, you know, the internal combustion engine may not be around as much longer as I would like. Yeah, but it's it's such a beautiful piece of a machinery and the intricacy and, you know, the mechanical engineering thought that goes into that over, you know, God knows how many engineers brains have been on that problem and made it better. Yeah. So, and like yeah. you said, everything's been done, but at the same time, everything needs to be done. 
<laughs> we're going to go electrical. It's going to change the game. Software is about to go to a whole nother level on vehicles. And, and, and part of what, what gets me excited about it, at this point, to the audience, we're just nerding out, right? Like, yeah, this, for sure. This, this, this is what we're all here for. This is what I get excited about on the show is just having this part of the conversation. <laughs> 10, 15 years ago, when you thought about cars, folks knew it was going to go electric. Folks knew that software would come around. Nobody knew Tesla would be, well, very few people knew that Tesla would be what it is, and very few people knew that automakers would step into self-driving as much as we've seen. But look at how robotics and cars have started to converge in such an interesting way. And for me, coming from a background of the automotive industry and loving robotics, it's just the possibilities are endless, man. The possibilities are endless to what we're going to see produced over the next yeah, couple of years. And, it's, and these robotic lawnmowers is, is one component of that. Well, for sure. But you can't attack the entire market. I mean, and so like one piece that's really interesting to me, and I guess this is true in automotive too, you just talked about this, but the fact that it's all interrelated. So like when you see an advance in, in compute hardware, like, you know, for instance, like the NVIDIA boards that were coming out a few years ago with the Xavier series, and the Jetson series, you know, with the NX, the AGX, the Nano, like all that stuff. I mean, the amount of like algorithm development that that enabled, you know, in terms of what was feasible, you know, I mean, like you said, it's it, now there's a revolution in software that's chasing that revolution in hardware. And then I'm sure we're going to see another revolution in hardware in photonics or something sometime soon. And then the algorithms that'll unlock, I mean, in terms of like what's what's feasible and what people can do. I mean, the fact that Google Maps exists, I know it's like a little bit off robotics, but those are algorithms that, you know, were considered maybe, was it NP complete? It's been a while since I studied computer science, but you know, like the, the traveling salesman problem, right? Where you're trying mm -hmm. to figure out a shortest path. Like that's not an easy math problem to solve. And the fact that we've solved it to the extent that we have is, is a miracle. I mean, to be frank, like, you know, it's, I mean, it's amazing that all that works. Um, I have a buddy who's a performance engineer um, and he's worked for IBM and NVIDIA and on a bunch of large scale systems. And so I don't know how to do any of that stuff, but when this guy is talking about like some of the stuff you have to do to scale these solutions and make it work on a fleet or on, you know, just, you know, like a large data center or something or on a large data set, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, he's, he's trolling, you know, like a lot of these data scientists a lot of the time, like it's not going to scale, you know, like being the cynical engineer, you know, and, so it, it, to me, it's just so exciting to see like, you know, another angle on something you thought you knew. And then it always humbles me just to like, be like, I'm, a, I'm an idiot, like compared to so many of the people out there, you know, and, and I think we all are in some way, like nobody wants to admit it, but I think the, the breadth of human knowledge is so great that no one person can know everything. And so, you know, we need each other. The man that knows something knows he knows nothing at all. Absolutely. That's Socrates, right? I get it from Badu. I think Socrates nice. said it too. That's I don't awesome. know if you know Erica Badu. That's I don't yet. That. Who's that? Who's that? Uh, who's Badu? Oh, she's a, a musician, an artist. Oh, that's cool. Makes really, really good music. Yeah. That's all. I got to check that out. I'm always in the market for good music. Yeah, Erica Badu. Erica Take a look. Badu. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. I know. I know. We got at least a couple more minutes here. I got a question for you. Spencer. Yeah. What's up, man? So I know we've been talking a lot about sort of what we're most excited about. Um, when you mentioned earlier about sort of having at times a pessimistic outlook about what the future could be like, how do you think we can fix that? Uh, how do you and think if I knew, I wouldn't be pessimistic. <laughs> <laughs> I wish how I knew. How do we achieve um, that utopian vision? Yeah, so I'm okay. Maybe I'll think about it from like a first principles perspective. So like, imagine I'm a consultant, somebody's brought in to solve this problem, and hmm. I don't, I wouldn't even pretend to be an expert on government relations. I think you would have to figure out a way to deter the worst aspects of human nature because that's really the obstacle to success is, is some jerk taking advantage of a power vacuum or of, you know, an opportunity that might, you know, like to, to, to basically get power over fellow people. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's, that's sort of your enemy. And so if you can figure out a way to suppress that or you can figure out a way to make it disincentivized or you can figure out a way to you know, somehow incentivize just cooperation and make that more advantageous than competition, then I feel like that's, your answer is kind of there. Like, I, I don't know what it is though. Like it's, 
it's difficult, right? I mean, I'm, I'm a pretty, as, as you probably are too, as, as a business owner, I'm a pretty hardcore capitalist. So I feel like it's all about incentives and like, you know, what makes sense from the individual's perspective. And if we're in a world where cooperating makes more sense than attacking each other, then we're going to, I think we're going to cooperate for the most part, unless you get an insane person that, you know, ignores the incentives, which could also happen, you know, then you're, you know, you kind of have to sort of proof it against that, you know, thing as well. But then it gets dangerous, right? Because if you build in too much government control or too much oversight or too much, you know, then you, you sort of create opportunity for like a corrupt entity to you know, have too much power in one place. So it's difficult to see. Again, I, I'm not a political expert by any means. This is all just, you know, two guys talking. But if I'm going to speculate, I feel like it's to do with that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Or am I off it the does. Clouds? It does. I agree with you. And I think to the point we were having earlier, it all comes down to people. So how, George, do sure? how would yep. you do it? Like, what would be your approach to solving that problem? Yeah, as I mentioned before, and as I was going to mention again, Sorry. it's all about people. No, it's all good. It's all about people. How do we make sure that people have the resources that they need? And I think you were hitting at the exact same thing, but how do we make sure folks have education, that we're talking to each other and understanding different perspectives of life, whether that's capitalism or how people grew up or where they grew up or how they got into what they're getting into or they've gotten into. I think all of that, making those connections is what helps us be able to create a better society. And as I mentioned before, for us to take robot, robotics or robots, whatever the case may be, to be able to do tasks that we spend eight to 10 hours a day currently doing and being able to spend more time connecting with people, yeah. that's what we're going to start to be able to, to make those big improvements in life. For sure. And that's something that we, we haven't largely been able to do for years, right? I could go see back, it going a different way too. Of human existence, then it might have been a case where people were able to spend a lot of time together and hunt together and, and connect in that way. But certainly not since our industrialist society have we been able to connect. Yeah, I mean, I could see it going the other way too. So, again, just just devil's advocate. Um, you know, you're right. Robots are a powerful tool to leverage more time to the individual, and so. Mm -hmm. um, say you took that time and you just put it back into industry, right? As the other direction you could go. It's like, I've got all this free time. What am I going to invent with that free time? You know, like maybe I'll, you know, I'll still be laboring, but instead of laboring in a field, I'll be, you know, at a computer coding up the next big thing, or, you know, I'll be, you know, in a machine shop figuring out, you know, or like in a lab figuring out, you know, how to get to like a part of the ocean we've never been able to, to, access or like how to get deeper into space or how yep. to build, you know, like a better, you know, housing for people that need it or something, you know, like, yep. so that, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's really, I mean, you could go so many different directions and I mean, I'm sure you've heard this anecdote where like in the early 1900s, George, they wanted to close the patent office because everything had already been invented. Right. And that's so far from the truth. I think we're going to see that again. Right. We're like, you know, people feel like we've hit a plateau and then, you know, oh my God, there's all this more stuff to do and, you know, we're not even close. Yeah. So, <laughs> like, I don't know, I could be wrong, but. <laughs> I, we got a lot of work to do, man. Yeah, and it's never going to be done. I mean, I don't know. It's, there's an infinite amount of, of things to discover and invent and, you know, just relationships to build. I mean, if you talk about like that side of it, I mean, there's so many, I mean, there, there's no way we're ever going to explore the, complete potential of human, you know, possibility. I mean, there's no way, like there's, you can't touch all that. It's infinite. Mm -hmm. So that's like really out. I usually don't have these kind of conversations like where I'm, where I'm going off and like, you know, like the 50 years in the future, like 25 mark. But I, I like that you're able to take a cynical bastard like me and, and get me to think this way. So, you know, I have, it's, mm -hmm really cool hanging out with you like this is super fun. I, I was gonna say the same thing man this has been a great conversation next time i'm in pittsburgh we'll have to get together offline and just continue to chat it up oh absolutely yeah, i think this is so important uh yeah dude after we do this like we'll talk about that too because like if you're serious like I'm, I'm happy to show you around the city and i mean you know I, I think i still have some good ties at carnegie mellon i could probably go in some of those labs with you and just show you you know kind of 
some of the places I came up in and I mean, it'd be fun, you know, and if I'm ever in St. Louis, it'd be good to see your, you know, your neck of the woods as well. Oh man, you definitely have to definitely do that. I, I guess I'll say in closing here about Pittsburgh, cause we were just there uh, toward the beginning of the month for a conference. That was my second time in Pittsburgh. Every time I come, I love it, but you can see the emphasis in robotics that I haven't seen in many other cities as I've been traveling across the country. And it starts at the airport. I didn't fly into the airport, but I flew out of the airport. And I mean, look at the literature on the walls. There's so much emphasis about how do we make Pittsburgh a center and a hub for robotics. And, and that's still exciting. Have... Not only, uh, not only exciting for the city. I just was just comment. Not only just exciting for the city, but exciting <laughs> for the entire industry. Amen, brother. Do they still have Friley's robot repair in that one terminal there? Is that still a thing? So let's let's talk about Fry's real quick. So I saw that and it blew my mind. I hadn't seen his art exhibit before, so I, I reached out to him on, on LinkedIn and uh, really really nice guy. I told him how much I enjoyed his art and thought it was really really interesting. And he ended up mailing me a couple stickers. Oh, that's like cool. That. Yeah, a really cool guy. For folks that haven't seen that yet, when you're going through the uh, Pittsburgh airport, make sure you stop by the Fry's art exhibit. It's like a it's like his rendition of a robot repair shop based in like the 50s. It's, it's really cool. Yeah, it's super, it's like reminiscent of like, I feel like Rosie, Rosie the Robot or the Jetsons or like, yep. it's real pop culture-y. And so it's it's, yep. it's super neat. And yeah, like you said, it kind of it kind of shouts Pittsburgh because of the obsession with robotics and, you know, some of the mid-century stuff that was going on. And, you know, it's, uh, I mean, I don't know, like I, I've probably lived in a dozen cities across the U.S., but I keep coming back here. I was looking at St. Louis on a map, though, just trying to do my diligence coming into this thing and, and understand where you're coming from as best I could before actually getting to know you. Um, you know, I mean, we talked maybe for like 10 minutes at that event. And so, because yeah. um, I mean, I don't know, you're a super popular guy there. You gave a talk that everybody loved. <laughs> so everybody wanted a piece of you. So I was just like, oh, maybe this guy will come on my podcast. You know, I'll talk to him. <laughs> so. Yeah. You know what I committed about you, Spencer? I was like, yeah, let's do it. Let's let's set up an email. Let's figure this out. You're like, no, nah, let's pull out calendars now. Let's get this schedule. <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. I love Thank it. You. I love it. Yeah. My one friend Paul said that about me too, because you know I, I'm I'm very quick to do that now. I think it's a sales tactic that just kind of kicks in from some of the training I've had across the years. But what I've noticed is if you don't do that, it just never happens. Like you just mm -hmm. get in limbo and and never do it. So. Yep. So, um, you know, like, yeah, why not? Like, let's, life is short. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, I'm glad we were able to do it. I'm oh, glad too. we were able to connect. I hope folks get some value out of this. I think going forward, you know, Hire Henry, again, we're developing the future of work in the space. And uh, we do a lot of posts on LinkedIn and Instagram and Facebook. Feel free to connect with us. We're going to be putting a lot of videos and content out awesome. over the next couple months for some of the deployments that we're doing on the East Coast. And you can look forward to a lot of a lot of exciting updates. Yeah, check it out. Hirehenry.com, I think. Dot US. Dot US, thanks. Hirehenry.us. Uh, <laughs> Hirehenry on Instagram, all the socials. Um, you should send me the socials after this, and I'll make sure they get posted in the description on the episode, too. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, no, this has been fun. I, I really enjoyed having you on. We should do it again sometime. Absolutely. All right.